and bots to start asking. We're ready for those. And then Ashley's going to join us again, and we're going to talk about what's happening with the digital instant cameras, which are very quietly like a hot, controversial would you situation. S- would you say at The Verge that we have a bevy of experts? A cornucopia. Cornucopia of expertise. It's a real situation. But first, we're going to get in all that. But first, Ashley and Jake are going to walk us through the news. Take it away. Hello. Yeah, so... We are rapidly approaching Samsung's phone season, and the leaks are starting. The S9 has leaked this week. There should be... Oh, hey, look at that. There's a photo. So this is... It looks just like you would expect a Galaxy device to look like. But hey, this is a nice color. It's a lilac, maybe. And then also, you'll notice the fingerprint sensor is below the camera as opposed to next to it, which was a huge complaint people had. There was also news today that... This phone is going to be priced more expensive than the S8, like right out of the gate. And people probably won't love that. So this is what we know so far is maybe what it looks like. And then also the Plus has dual vertically stacked cameras, which we don't see here. But it's kind of like the iPhone 10. What's really wild to me is that like a year ago, this design really stood out. And now this looks completely normal. This is the front of every single phone. Yeah, exactly. It like, doesn't wow you anymore. You're just yeah. like, oh, yeah, um, full full display. I'm okay. all about Samsung doing weird and interesting colors, though. Nobody else yeah, we like the colors here. We cover every Samsung yes. color because oh. we love them so much. Love it. Um, yesterday, Intel, out of nowhere, basically, announced smart glasses. They're called Vaunt. We have an exclusive hands-on. You should go read Dieter's article. We have a big video on it. Uh, But the gist is that uh, these are smart glasses that look completely normal. So if you're thinking Google Glass, these are kind of all the way in the other direction. Rather than interacting with them a bunch with swipes and gestures and having a screen in front of your face, there's basically nothing. There is just some lasers that shoot a little projection into your eye. And you don't even see it all the time. It's just in in your peripheral vision. It'll show some notifications, um, some contextual information. But it's basically just supposed to stay out of the way so that... uh, it's there when you want it, but not when you, you know, are actually talking to people and trying to interact with the rest of the world. Um, I think it's like a really neat and interesting approach, and it sounds like they've learned a lot of the lessons that, uh, you know, Google did not realize when it first did Glass. Like people don't want to wear a computer on their face. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they definitely still have a lot to prove, but uh, they're supposed to come out with a developer version by the end of the year. So. Uh, yeah, I so definitely am really interested when people start using this and how people interact with each other okay. while they're, I mean, technically are wearing a computer on their face. Like, how I'm going to talk to you right. right now, but also be, like, silently watching my Twitter feed. Oh, you're going to no get all kinds Jake. of... No, I'll sorry. give you full attention sometimes. <laughs> um, so, iPhone 10, we all know it for its notch, and now Chinese phone manufacturers are introducing a bunch of notch knockoffs as we've started calling them so this is the ocatel one you can see there's the notch and then we have another one that just came out as well called the noah n10 also has a notch um what's interesting about these is that like the notch is great we like the notch but you're not fooling like no one's going to see this and think oh that's an iphone 10 like this is not an iphone 10 body also the screen doesn't go all the way to the bottom you have also the android navigations i mean it's just not fooling anyone but you yeah. have a notch please? right like so android's not optimized for this which no. is like gonna be horrible right people have waited for their favorite apps to be optimized and, like, and android definitely is not going to have not. those apps i know people like the notch is very controversial i actually think it is cool because it's like instantly identifiable which i think is what they're going for here but like it's gonna it's pretty clear that this is not right an iphone yeah, yeah i really like the notch yeah. but i don't know if i like it on the notch knockoffs yes <laughs> Um, Microsoft last week dropped the price on two of its Surface laptops quite a bit. The Surface Book 2 went down by $300. The Surface Laptop went down by uh, $200. Did I say that right? $300 and $200. Um, this is a pretty big decrease, the, which is great because it's going to help get more people into the line for them. But uh, the downside is that uh, they have worse specs, a uh, slower processor or less storage. I think that's an okay trade-off in some cases, um, but you know, it's not necessarily the best thing. It's not like they just dropped the price on the current entry level. They made like a new entry level that's a bit cheaper. Um, I my guess as to why this happened is because the Surface devices haven't been like selling quite as well as uh, I people thought they expect were doing them to. really well. They were doing like surprisingly well, but when Microsoft announced their earnings recently, I think it was like a one percent year-over-year growth, which 
uh, is probably why they're trying to get more people in with these lower prices. And you get the fancy fabric. Totally, they're nice looking computers. That you can care for yeah. delicately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and finally this week we saw that HP has decided that it's going to introduce new smart assistant skills for Alexa or Google Home, whichever, uh, so that you can talk to your printer and apparently shout at it to print you Sudoku puzzles. I, I don't know why this was their example. The they it's just really been... want they want you to just shout and say, "Hey, printer," or whatever your keyword is, and say, "Hey, printer." print me this document. Printers already I don't even know what you say to a printer. To. Print the thing. Right. You need to have a document open. Like, I don't understand. Right. That, that's why I don't understand because you're always at a computer. Are they operating a cloud service for Sudoku puzzles? That, like... He has... You know, it's not clear. Okay. Jake, it's really just not clear. But, um, yeah, I figure you're always at a computer anyways looking at the document thinking, okay, you know what would be nice is like to have this printed. Let me just print. Yeah. Instead, you're going to be like, wait, this would be nice to have printed. Set this aside. Yeah. Alexa, I need the pr this print this. While you're with your family <laughs> yeah. and you're at dinner, be like, now. When, do, when does the people. idea ever strike that you're walking around your kitchen and you're like, I, you know what? I forgot I to print that thing. <laughs> Whatever. Good for you, HP. Do, keep doing you. Um, all right. So we're going to give it right back now to Paul and Eli. We're back. Whoa. Sean O'Kane is here. Hello, I Sean. bumped into you. That's fine. I'm a little jittery. Just watched a gigantic rocket take off from Cape Canaveral. Yeah, okay, so Sean, you, Sean is a reporter on our transportation team. He's here to talk about drones, but this is true. You also cover a bunch of space with our terrific space reporter, Lauren Grush, who is at Cape Canaveral. She is. She just saw the thing go into the sky and do its thing. I, we were all watching that stream right before the show started. And then the little ones landed. Yep, that's the technical <laughs> so, term. So let's just talk about it. We, got, we can't ignore it. Yeah. Sean, you cover a bunch of space. Uh, Tell us how important Falcon Heavy was. Uh, I mean, if we ever want to do more than we're already doing in space, we need bigger rockets to do things that are more impressive than the things we've been doing. So like, like go big to rockets. the moon? So, um, go to the moon, go to Mars, um, bring heavier. If we ever want to do like internet in space mm -hmm. based on satellites, I we do. need heavier lift rockets. Yes. Um, and so, you know, SpaceX had a pretty clever solution to this, which um, was this sort of multiple rockets strapped together uh, solution, um, which we've seen before, but their whole idea is they're going to land them all. Um, we know that two of the three landed. We have, we we're not sure about the one that's supposed to land in sea yet. Um, the drone ship. But I mean, it was one of those things where like no one was really totally sure it was going to survive the whole thing. So I mean, the whole point, the whole goal was don't explode. Yeah, right. basically so they, they, that's what Elon Musk said. Way overachieved the goal. He but, said as long as it doesn't ruin the launch pad, I'm fine. Yeah, and so it didn't. So and the bonus points is he, Elon Musk's. Tesla yeah. is the payload. Which kind of looks like this drone. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there's a Tesla in space now. Whatever. Yeah, uh, that's great. crazy. My favorite part of this is that the, Paul was asking us earlier, they can't land the Tesla on Mars because right. we don't want to contaminate Mars. There, he said yesterday on a press conference uh, that there is a tiny, tiny chance it hits Mars, which he'll actually be in some deep water if it does, but it's not going to. He's going to miss it by a lot. He's just trying to make a, a spectacle out of it. I'm ready to contaminate Mars. <laughs> yeah. The first thing we contaminate Mars with should not be Elon Musk's car. That's Fair. what you think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sean. Anyway, The Falcon Heavy is super <laughs> exciting. Uh, I was actually sad that it was running into our show because I wanted to watch it. Yeah. But it, all the timing worked out. We got to watch it. And now we're here to talk about drones. Other sure. things that fly, maybe yeah. not quite as high. Uh, <laughs> well this done. is the DJI Mavic Air. It just came out, right? It just came out. Uh, they announced it, God, two weeks ago, yeah. maybe three. Uh, put it on sale less than a week later. Um, they've gotten really good at this sort of like, uh, maybe some rumors and stuff leak. But otherwise, like, here's the thing. It's available next week. Like, get ready. They, I think they've really, they're a company that's really honed their sort of product presence over the last couple of years. And they've made really good products. This is sort of the latest and greatest from them. Um, and it is, if you're familiar with the DJI lineup, there's the Mavic Pro at the top, which we have right here on Well, the, it's like the Inspire, of, the sorry, Phantom, of the, like there's a whole... Of the more like portable ones, yeah. right? The, the ones that are at $1,000 or less. And so we've got the Mavic Pro, which is a little bit more than 1000 The Spark, which is the one they released uh, a couple months ago, maybe even, or I guess back in 2017, which is a more approachable drone for people who are just starting out. Um, and then now this is the Mavic Air, and it sort of slots in between those two, but it also kind of replaces the Mavic Pro. It's, uh, in many ways, other than maybe battery life and, like, a couple small details, it's basically this in this package, which yeah. is pretty wild. So what's the point? Of, so DJI's lineup is, it's either the simplest thing in the world 
or the most complicated? Yeah, this probably complicated things a little bit. This is seven ninety nine. Um, you can get it for nine ninety nine with a whole bunch of extra batteries um, and and sort of extra propellers and yeah. things like that. Um, but you do get a lot for seventy seven ninety nine. This is three ninety nine. Used um, to be six hundred, right? Used to be five hundred and six hundred with all the extra okay, stuff. Okay. So this one's really still the entry level. What complicates things is if this is really replacing this, but they're still selling this for more. Right. Uh, that's where it's a little bit weird. But so this one folds up to be this big. Yeah. And that one folds up to be smaller. This correct? folds up into a profile that is yes even smaller than the Spark. Wait. So the Spark is obviously lighter. Um, I'm showing you that it's lighter. <laughs> uh, the Spark is lighter than the Mavic Air. Kind of like a handy, handy carrying yeah, case. Yeah, and this too. is the carrying case that comes in. The too. case is smaller than the case from a Nintendo Switch. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Um, so I didn't quite wrap it up. So right. I there bought a Phantom. Before DJI like went on this tear, right. before the first Mavic came out, I bought a Phantom 4, and I was like, this is the one. Yeah. This is the consumer like ground. Richie Rich. <laughs> Yes. Well, my forthcoming child is not going to college now, but she can look well, at my drone flying in the air. Right, sure. uh, but I thought that was like we've hit the pinnacle. This is a small, and then DJI just went on this absolute tear. Yeah, with the, of these smaller, the and smaller Mavic drones, and now this, and then the Spark, and now the Air. So all within one, the last like year and a half. So which one do you buy? Um, so I the the split for me is the same split. I think that um, our one of our videographers and directors out west, Viren who did the review of the Mavic Air, I think he elucidated it pretty well in his review. The split is, if you're doing any kind of professional work, um, you know, weddings, landscape photography, things like that, you're probably still better off opting for the Phantom, the Phantom 4, the Phantom 4 Pro, depending on, um, there's a couple different versions, that's, that's where it gets actually really confusing. <laughs> um, but if you're just a hobbyist, or if portability really, really matters to yeah. you, the Mavic Air is for sure the, I mean, the one is, you want. Yeah, because you can let's make, let's might do a little bit of damage to the propellers, but you can yeah, fit yeah, it in a fine. pocket. And then we're going to fly it in the studio. And it's this, gonna this is a good reason to, to wear cargo pants. <laughs> yes, you said it. <laughs> Finally. Um, Finally. And, it, and it's just, it, the value really comes from the ability to not be lugging around because if you've ever seen anybody use the Phantom 4 Pro or yeah. the Phantom 4 and you know this it's huge and the box that you have to fit it in because none of it folds up it's yeah. got those big landing legs um, and even this was like a little bit heavy you've always got this exposed whereas the camera now is sort of tucked in here on the Mavic Air uh, the Mavic Air has the same camera system as the Mavic Pro so, so the image quality is the same yeah and the only benefit you really still get with the Mavic Pro and the, the new version of it, the Mavic Pro Platinum, is you get a few more extra minutes of battery life. Um, this also works over, over RF with the controller as opposed to Wi-Fi, um, which means the range is a little bit longer mm -hmm. um, than the Mavic Air. But, I mean, the Mavic Air, those are your trade-offs. You want to get slightly less range so, by, like, a mile or two. Problems with yeah, so people on YouTube, Wi Jordan on YouTube here is saying in the chat, this uses, he's pointing out this uses Wi-Fi to connect. Yes. And you get a little bit less range. Yeah. And he, people are pointing out the video signal to your phone or whatever is less good. I don't think that matters. As long as you I didn't have as many see problems. what it's doing, it doesn't matter. I, especially because, like, I, if I were to use it, I would use it for, especially for photography and videography, more than just the fun of flying it. And that kind of stuff usually really bothers me if, like, yeah. the video is cutting out. I didn't experience that with this. I didn't fly it too far away because it's been really windy all weekend mm -hmm. here. How did it do um, wind? It actually held up pretty well. Um, gusts of, like, 25. Life? No, it, it really didn't. That was the weirdest thing about it. Um, it, if you were filming straight through, like trying to pull off like kind of a smooth maneuver, anything above 15 miles an hour was starting to give it a little bit of trouble as far as like, you know, it would correct and you could see that in the footage. Does it fight um, the wind or does it just kind of go with the flu? It's, it, there's a tolerance, right? Like if it gets, if a gust comes at some point, you, you could see it in the footage in the way that it would, you know, the gimbal, which is trying to hold it steady, mm. would all of a sudden just sort of like jump and like finally give in. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it held up pretty well. And the battery life, I mean, I think when you're working with a max of 21, the differences of what, of what you're going to get. Yeah, are how far you're going to go. Yeah, they're pretty small anyways. So, Paul, if you can show this camera. These... So we asked DJ about this too. I think all of us have asked about the Wi-Fi versus RF. Yeah. Mm. So these are actually the Wi-Fi antennas in these legs. Whoa. Yeah. And they, the reason that at least they told me, I'm sure they told you the same thing, they can't fit the RF components into a chassis this small yeah. to do the custom RF signal. So they had to go with this boosted Wi-Fi. And especially because this has seven cameras on it. You can see all the way around. It has cameras on like basically every surface, um, which means that it has obstacle avoidance 
in every direction now, which they haven't had in these other smaller drones before. Mm -hmm. um, has, to the point that it even has a mode where you can set it to, it's called A-Pass, I forget what it stands for right now, but basically instead of like what, what this would do if it saw something approaching it, mm -hmm. it would just stop so it wouldn't crash, which is great. But what this can do is it, with enough cameras on it, it can actually sort of plot out a path to get around the obstacle. So if you've set the drone to sort of like follow a mountain biker and like you just like let it go and follow that path, but all of a sudden there's a tree that you didn't really think was in the way, but is, mm -hmm. it can move around that and it won't really disturb that shot too much. It'll keep that person in focus. It just feels like they're not holding anything back. They're not like, well, this is the mid tier. We better make sure that it doesn't eclipse this one. They're just like, I think, here's what we have technology wise. We're putting it in a drone. Here you go. I think it was a bold move to sort of just like, up and essentially kind of replace this, but it does sort of pave the path for them to do something new with this like $1,000 and up right. version that they have. You know, like they could maybe make the Phantom 4 a little bit smaller now, or maybe they could do something even crazier, like 40 minute battery life in this form factor or Jeez. something. I know, right? Um, we gotta talk about these controllers. Yeah, and so they're, they're real different. So this is the Mavic. That's the Mavic Pro's controller, which has well, you can see. an integrated screen in there to, um, give you some basic information, but it's still meant for you to plug your phone in your phone to use as the phone. viewfinder. What I really like about, um, this is such a small little detail, but they, um, the joysticks on the new Mavic Air controller tuck right in here, so that when you pack it up, like I'm a kind of person that just like throws stuff in his bag and like they, the objects suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. Whereas like here you can take these off at the end, plug them in and you're not having these like get mangled up in your, or like catch something else in a bag. Um, and then you just take your phone, get face ID on, um, and slot it in. Okay. Are we gonna light this thing up? I mean, we right. should, right? I mean, we're here. That's the whole point of the show. Um, another thing to know about the Mavic Air is that it has some more advanced gesture controls compared to the Spark. The Spark, you were able to let fly like off your um, your hand and everything. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the, Mavic, the Mavic Air, you can actually take off from the ground. So if I was standing in front of this right now, I could hold my hand out. Um, it would recognize that, it would fly up um, and do things like that. Uh, and I will say, I, I have watched a lot of videos uh, that people have put online just for our own sanity. Uh, <laughs> oh, I've watched come on. <laughs> What's come on, the fun of that? If you want. Let's, right. do right, let's do it. What are we here for? That's why the, that's why the people watch. I it's have like a, NASCAR. There is this, uh, yeah, there is this guy in, uh, in Texas. Oh, I gotta turn the remote on. That probably would help. Um, there's this guy in Texas who was just sort of standing out in the middle of nowhere, and he was only able to get about, uh, I want to say like a mile and a half range. And they're mm -hmm. advertising two and a half miles of this. So I do still think if, if you're someone who's flying if you're a skilled pilot who's still flying very far away, uh, you're probably not going to want to opt for the air. But the air is really, yeah. it's like the perfect thing to like always have at the ready. You yeah. know, like maybe if you're a pro, you fly with your, um, you fly with your Phantom. That's but like this is the thing that you always have ready whenever you need it. I'm terrified. Yeah, you should be. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Maybe Here's the put, thing: it can totally go. On. It can totally yeah. go worse than the Falcon Heavy launch because the Falcon Heavy Look, launch actually went really last well. Last month, Paul, we flew the Mav the full size Mavic in a hotel room without guards. Though? Without guards, there are no guards. All right. Lauren just like lit it up and took out. All right, uh, I'm just backing up a little bit. All right, here I, we go. I realize I, I put out a lot of uh, bravery and confidence. Whoa! Ooh. Nice. That's uh, it's awfully windy. So with the spark, you can so it's loud. <laughs> uh, they haven't made it any quieter than the Mavic Pro Platinum. Uh, the Mavic Pro Platinum has these new propellers that are quieter, yeah. about 10 decibels. So this is definitely not quieter. No. Uh, so it's smaller, which means it's discreet. But like, yeah. people still know when you take yeah, off. Right. Yeah. So here's, oh, there's us. Okay. Let's take a. Oh, and here's the thing. I forgot to put a memory card back in this, but it has eight gigs of internal storage now. So. Oh, and it's full. All right. Now, I wonder if I... <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's not working for you. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think I had to turn on the gesture recognition, but uh, I, I will say, Come back. Oh. 
I am so ready to run. No. We'll yeah. just set it down over there. Here we go, man. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna throw my camera at it. Because it wasn't backing up, so we'll just land it over there. Um, I will say, <laughs> it is, uh, as someone who's flown a couple of these different drones in the past, it is, like, really easy to fly. Like, they've really smoothed out sort of all the algorithms as far as, like, um, how it balances itself out. It has a sport mode that does 42 and a half miles an hour, which is actually terrifying. I flew that around a field, and then I brought it back towards me, uh -huh. and the distance it needs to stop, I, I wasn't sort does of ready it, for, so it, does like, almost turn off the me. smart features? The, like the, is that like a kill all humans mode where where it will just go right into something if you're driving it? Or does it still no, have it's still, obstacle avoidance? No, it still has that obstacle avoidance. You'll lose some of the obstacle avoidance, um, I think, when it's far out. Like, I remember bringing it up to a certain height, and mm -hmm. it would tell me that it would lose some of that. But, um, but yeah, uh, it's it's otherwise relatively easy to fly. Is there another the footage looks great. from another company to buy? No. no. Hey, hey, guys, hey, guys. Hey, people are asking DJ, we the wrote our big trader Ben Popper yeah, who yeah. Le just here, left us for DJI. Here, here you go, Neil. Uh, yeah, this is from the archives. You're a dead karma. He wrote a thing over a year ago, almost, yeah, a year and a half I like ago. we said, stripped this of its propellers to really yeah. give DJI's it DJI's only real feel. competition is itself at yeah. this point. Um, all the other ones don't really compare. The, car the karma was like, I don't know, maybe in another generation or two it could compete a bit. Even CEO Nick Woodman of GoPro has admitted, like, there's just no way that they were not, like, vertically integrated enough to, like, make something new as fast as a company like DJI. Yeah. So these are really, this is, like, where you want to look if you are looking to get into drones. I still think if you've never flown one before, Spark's still the best way to go. It's cheapest. It still does a decent video, at least for social. Yeah. Um, maybe not for pro work, um, but... The real killer would be if you could fold those legs in. Yeah, that's the only thing. Is like if you have a couple extra hundred bucks to spare. Oh, it's down on the ground. Uh, the <laughs> air does land. <laughs> the air does tuck in pretty nicely. Yeah. So, well, look, yeah. I can't think of a better thing to take photos of my new baby with than a drone. And a terrifying everyone, by the way, drone. everyone in the chat was noticing that sound is incredibly threatening. Yeah, oh. it's not. Drones I, are always threatening. The first I get really go I, rescue the drone if that's okay. I get yeah. a lot of social anxiety, so I went like all the way outside the city to fly this thing, and I set it down in a park, and there was almost nobody around me, and then it yeah. fired up, and I was like, "Oh God, this is too much!" Like everybody knows that I'm flying this thing, yeah. and they just can't see it because it's smaller. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Everyone wants to know if the core booster landed. I think you probably are dying I do too, to yeah. know. I need so to know. we're gonna let Sean go. We're gonna find out what's going on with the core booster. We'll let you know on the live stream here. Uh, but we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna watch a little bit of the HomePod review to get through some of the super nitty gritty technical details. And then Dan Siebert's gonna be here. We're gonna have basically every smart speaker that we can get our hands on, plus the HomePod. Ask us your questions in the chat. We're ready to answer them. We're ready to ask Siri your questions. Let's watch this video, we'll be right back. So, this is the HomePod. The HomePod is Apple's answer to the Google Home and the Amazon Echo and every other smart speaker out there with a voice assistant. It's a $350 speaker that has Siri. The basic idea is pretty simple. It's covered in a weird spongy fabric. There's a touch display on top and it's surprisingly heavy. But the HomePod is pretty limited. Siri just can't do as much as other assistants and the only music service you can control with your voice is Apple Music. If you're a Spotify person, the HomePod is probably not for you. And I think Apple knows it's pretty limited because all of the company's focus is on sound quality. The truth is most other smart speakers sound crappy and the HomePod sounds incredible. We've been comparing it to the new Amazon Echo, a bunch of Sonos speakers, including the new Sonos One and the Play 5, the Google Home and the Google Home Max, and even Bluetooth speakers like the UE Megaboom. And it's just obviously better than all of them. The HomePod isn't just one speaker, it's actually eight of them all controlled by an A8 processor and tons of custom software. There are seven tweeters that fire down and out from the bottom, and a single four-inch woofer pointing out of the top for low frequencies. There's also a total of seven microphones, six around the middle for Siri, and a seventh inside that measures the location of that woofer so Apple can precisely control the bass. When you first plug in the HomePod and start playing music, it goes through a series of steps that tune the speaker to the room it's in. First, it uses the mics to detect any walls nearby so it knows how sound will bounce off of them. Second, it uses those seven tweeters to form a virtual array of sound beams that are assigned direct and ambient sounds like vocals and applause. The ambient channels are pointed at the walls to reflect, and the direct sounds are pointed out at the listener. 
Sometime during all of that, it detects the walls again to refine the model of the room it's in. Then it analyzes the difference between the left and right channels of the music you're playing to figure out what sound should go into what beams, ambient or direct. And then it measures the position of the subwoofer and the reflections of the bass constantly as you're playing music to make sure the bass doesn't overwhelm the rest of the music. And all of this happens at once, within like 10 seconds. If you move the HomePod, an accelerometer inside detects motion and it does it all over again. In terms of ideas I'm into, a virtual array of sound beams that points guitar solos at my face is super high on the list. We're back. Ben Seifert's here. Hi. How's it going, buddy? I'm doing well. How so are you? I'm all right. I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to Siri. Uh-huh. That's a fun time. It's, it's, it's all right. So you have reviewed most of the other smart speakers. I just reviewed the HomePod. We just watched that video. Uh, I've had it for about a week now. Apple took me to, they didn't take me, they invited me to Cupertino. <laughs> I took myself there. <laughs> we paid our own way, as we always do. Um, but went out to Cupertino, hung out with their hardware VP, hung out with their head engineer for audio, hung out with Phil Schiller, uh, walked through their audio labs and some of the engineers, got really deep in how the HomePod works. Mm. Uh, you listen to a lot of Hotel California. We listen to a lot of Hotel California, <laughs> which is a true experience. The video, you just watched it, I think what's happening on the audio side of the HomePod is super impressive and cool. Um, I'm an audio nerd. I like have all kinds of speakers in my house. Usually, I don't like love a lot of audio processing. This thing is doing so much computing to make itself sound good all of the time that I just the part where it has seven speakers here. So you think all seven speakers are doing something different? Those seven speakers are actually making three virtual speakers, and they're firing back against the wall or out to the front. Like, all of that is so cool. There's a microphone inside that measures the position of the subwoofer. I don't, I don't precisely trust control it. I don't trust that position. Yeah. Back, back in my day, yeah. two bookshelf speakers, yeah. a nice amp. Some sliders. Yeah, you need that graphic EQ. Yeah. No, I don't even need an EQ. So, Give it to me. We're, I'm just, we're just going to start going in on questions here. Yeah. Um, first question everybody asked in the chat, is there a mute switch? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> and the answer is basically no. So all the other ones, uh, the echo here is, or the echo is muted. You can see it's red. The Sonos one, you push the button on top, it mutes. The mic is muted. The Google Home devices have switches. Here's what you can do with the HomePod, which is not necessarily great. You can say, hey, Siri, stop listening. And then serious Siri. And there's no com no confirmation. Wait, no, it did, just... no, it, no, it confirms. It just didn't work. <laughs> hey Siri, <laughs> stop listening. I can turn off Hey Siri, but if I do, you'll need to press the top of the device to get my attention. Is this what you want? Yes. Okay. I've turned off Hey Siri. So now it's off. Wow. So now if you if you wanna you can be like <laughs> Nope. You gotta hold it down. There you go. What's the weather? No, it'll do it. Or it won't. It's, it's still, currently cloudy there you go. and 37 degrees in a. So can, Siri is a lot now, more responsive. Now, if you want to turn, actually, you do need Paul Can Paul. Because if you want to turn that back on, you go into the Home app. Okay. And then you force touch on HomePod, right. and then you press Details. <laughs> Get rid of my Slack messages. <laughs> and then you go here, and you got to click that back on. Oh, nice. So that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bunch <laughs> of steps. No problem. Um, the other thing that I pointed out in the review video, everyone focused on Spotify. We'll get into Spotify in a second. I think this is actually the bigger problem with the HomePod. Mm -hmm. Right now, the way it is configured, if you just hit yes on all the setup prompts, the setup is super easy. Right. Just blast through it. It will just let anyone read my texts. So, hey, Siri. Wait, wait, wait. Let me see what my last text is. <laughs> uh, okay. Is it, is yeah, it, yeah, go is ahead. It SFW? Go ahead. Say, read my most recent text message. Hey, Siri, read my most recent text message. It's from Walt. I found your most recent message from, from Walt, Walt Mossberg. Whoa, look uh, at you. Cool. Would that's, you like to this reply? Is, that's it. No. <laughs> like, that's crazy. Okay. No. no. Stay away. That is bonkers. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. anybody in your house just rolls it. And the gate yeah. is if you're just on the same Wi-Fi network. Yeah. How, so do, you, how it, do you turn that off? 
Okay, watch this. Okay. We, uh, okay. So, we, so if we you're, back to the podcast so I, I think if you're in a in a dorm, yeah, uh, and you're on the dorm Wi-Fi, and you're, I mean, it's expensive, so not, but some college students are gonna buy this. Right. You're on the dorm Wi-Fi, and you leave your dorm room, and you're like in the dining hall. Someone can walk up to your closed door, and like yell the wake word and ask it to read your text messages, and it will just do it. Wow. So you just turn that off. So here's how you turn it off. This is a lot of steps. So this is the HomePod settings. Sure. Oh, that's fine. Um, yeah, so you think it's, it's so you're be already here. in there because so you you've gone this, through the process. Yeah. And you, it's not there. It's here. <laughs> in the compass? Is yep. that a compass? And you go here. And then you go, you pick your house and you do that. You know, I want to show you my email address. Okay. It's here. And you turn it off there. So it's like not in the HomePod settings, it's in your house settings. Which mm, is that's logical. Not sensible. So this is a home kit device? It's a home kit device. So those are those that those two things, just those two little configuration things mm -hmm. where you don't want anybody to roll up to it and read your text and turning the mic on and off. Requi just they just require you to operate your phone mm -hmm. in a way that none of these other devices really want you to use your phone. Mm -hmm. Like right. the Alexa devices, the Alexa app is horrible. Like it is actively designed to make yeah. you not want to it's use almost, it. Almost feels intentionally so, yeah. Because mm -hmm. they just want you to talk to Alexa. The Home app is fine, but Google just wants you to talk to it. Whatever. The HomePod to me is just directly connected to your phone, mm -hmm. your individual phone. On the review, I called it lonely, and I think that's like sad. Yeah, it's just sad. Like, that part's sad to me. <laughs> All right, what else do people want to know? Um, also, Siri, I mean, we, we, we just have... Hey, Siri. Hey, Siri. Play some music. Sure. Let's kick things off with Planets and Stars by First Code. Sure. That's weird. Hey, Siri. Play Taylor Swift. We're just going to do this. We're just going to deal with the licensing issues. Sure. Here's a personalized station of Taylor Swift. Hey. Personalized to me. This is Chris. Uh, this is Neil's favorite. It's my favorite. So you can be like, "Hey Siri, who plays the bass on this song?" I don't know who plays that instrument for this band. And that is basically the Siri experience. <laughs> yeah. A lot of I don't know. A lot of I don't know. Hey Siri, how much does a HomePod weigh? Everything you need to know about HomePods is on Apple's website. Ask Alexa, though. All right. Alexa, how much does a HomePod weigh? Private residences, average weight is 100. Private residence? <laughs> what? Wait, how much does a private weight? You just asked how much does a home weigh, and just like gave uh, That's what I said, right? Like Apple HomePod. No. Oh, we, we did this before, right? Yeah. Alexa, how much does a HomePod weigh? Apple HomePod weighs 5.5 .5 pounds. There yeah. we go. And Google has it wrong because the answer is wrong in Google. <laughs> so it's just like, it's it's Siri. It works as well as Siri works. Mm -hmm. And that it's supposed to be able to tell you who's playing on all the songs that you listen to. It's not. We can't show you what it sounds like here. Like, we're just not set up for that in the studio. If you watch the video, we set up a really fancy binaural microphone. We Put played, some headphones on. We played the same studio, song yeah. through all the speakers in a, in a pretty good location in my house. Um, and you can, you can actually hear... A difference, not mm -hmm. like the difference. You really need to hear it in person. But the biggest question, the controversy of the morning, mm. is Spotify. <laughs> because I said in the review, it doesn't work with Spotify. Mm. And Jonathan Morrison, who's a good dude who I like, and we watch his videos, and he collabs with us, his video is like, yes, you can use it with Spotify. Here's the difference. I'm going to explain this to everybody. You can AirPlay to this using virtually any app on your phone that supports AirPlay. Mm -hmm. You push the button, it's on your phone, you can send it over over AirPlay. AirPlay supports some playback commands. So you can basically play, pause, next track, previous track. It's a big, fancy remote control. Right. But because it doesn't have buttons, you can just say next track, backtrack. It will send that command to your phone over AirPlay, and that will pass to Spotify. Okay. So you get, like, so remote it's control. It's Spotify support. <laughs> yeah, so that's not Spotify support. Spotify, <laughs> it's not like running Spotify. It doesn't know it's Spotify. It's just sending these like. Yeah, you can't ask it what song it's the same it is as or my Bluetooth like speaker yeah. has playback controls on the top, right. and it will like lightly control the thing. It also doesn't have Bluetooth. Doesn't have you can't Bluetooth to it. Doesn't have. Well, let me just finish this thought. Oh, I'm sorry. What you want sorry. it? It's an iOS computer. It's your review. A, it's your review. It has an AA processor. It should just be able. You should just be able to set Spotify as a default right. and say, "Hey, play me a song." Absolutely. And it should just play it from Spotify. Mm -hmm. So there's this limited 
support for playback controls on any AirPlay app, mm -hmm. Spotify, Tidal, Pandora, what have you. Mm. I think that is very different than controlling Spotify. It sounds like what you're saying is that this sounds great, but it's a big dummy. But isn't that true of any truly great rock star? <laughs> 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 um, people are asking about the power cord in the chat. The power cord is well, incredibly it's, nice. It's, it's, like a little so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's it. super nice, but it's also permanently attached, mm -hmm. which means that if you vacuum it or your cat tears it or yeah, whatever, yeah, you have to go so get the whole thing power. repaired. Whereas virtually every other one of these has a detachable power cord that you can replace very easily, yeah. which just seems like a weird, weird thing. But it is a very, it, it reminds me of a vacuum. Okay, here's the other big question that just caught in the chat from Raul was asking in the chat here. Can you play music on the Apple TV and have it play in the HomePod at the same time? That sounds like a great idea. So it's a $350 speaker. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if you're a normal-ish person, it's probably the best speaker you're going to own. You probably want to play your TV out of it. If you have an Apple TV, you can set the Apple TV to AirPlay to it, like any other AirPlay speaker. That will connection will last mm -hmm. until you ask it to play music. Okay. Then it will lose that connection. And then when you go to watch the Apple TV again, you have to go back into settings and set it to AirPlay again. Are the settings in the HomeKit app or on no, the Apple TV? No, they're on the Apple TV. Mm. So every time you watch something, you got to make sure you're connected to the, the HomePod as an AirPlay device, which seems incredibly inconvenient. Right. Uh, you also, if you have an Apple, if you don't have an Apple TV, you can't use it as a TV speaker. Mm -hmm. If you have an Apple TV and a PlayStation, you can't use it as the PlayStation speaker, right. just the Apple TV. So I don't think it's ready to be a TV connected speaker unless literally all you have in your life is Apple products and you only use the Apple TV and you're willing to deal with that AirPlay nonsense in the middle. That's my goal. <laughs> Are you saying this is the best speaker on this table or like one of the best speakers you've ever heard? It's one of the best speakers I've ever heard, without what? a doubt. It is, I mean, like, okay, it is the best speaker on this table. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, Dan, I think you reviewed the Home Max. I did, yes. Um, and, you know, the, the funny part is, like, any one of these in a vacuum is going to sound really good. Like, the Home Max, if you don't compare it to anything else, if this is the speaker you bought and you put in your house, you're probably going to be really happy with the way it sounds. Mm -hmm. The same for the Sonos One, which sounds excellent on its own. Uh, these two are a little different. They, you know, they kind of sound like garbage right away. But... When you compare them head to head and side by side, the HomePod basically stands out from everything. It's, it, it fills a room better. It's got better bass response without getting muddy. Mm -hmm. It uh, just sounds more full. And like there are certain things that maybe the Sonos One is a little clearer on certain frequencies. But overall, most people, I would say like 99 out of 100, if in a blind test, are going to probably pick the HomePod as the one. Yeah, um, so we... The, the Home Max is very loud and very big, but it has this like weird scooped sound, which means that it has a very low mid-range, but like boosted bass and boosted trebles. So it has so, this kind and, of weird sound. To and it. the Home app, a lot of people ask me this, the Home app does have EQ settings, but the I agree with Dan. It sounds like really boosted bass, really boosted treble. Mm. You know what slider isn't in the home app's EQ settings? Mid range. It's... Oh, no. So it's just like you yeah, can't this, fix it. This, when you compare this to, say, like a Sonos Play 5, which is roughly the same size and the same price range and everything, mm. this just sounds like it has this like filter over the sound that's like softening it, and you lose a lot of that clarity for some reason. But like I said, if you never compare it, I, don't, I think we're probably, like, reviewers are the only ones who are going to compare these head to head. If someone mm. buys this and puts it in their house, they're going to probably be really happy happy with it but you know there yeah. are better options out there so th i think these are the two best i actually i really don't like the way the home max sounds that's my personal taste it's all very subjective head to head this sounds better than the sonos but again this sounds really good and it lets you do spotify and lets you control spotify with alexa mm -hmm. so and oh sorry <laughs> it's like a danger of the workplace here um and sonos is like a music platform so you can get all kinds of sound speakers that fit all kinds of rooms. And Spotify right. Connect is on all kinds of devices. You can't do the stereo pairing with this. Not yet. And AirPlay 2 isn't out. When AirPlay 2 comes out, Sonos will support it. And you'll be able to tell this to light up a Sonos speaker over AirPlay. Which you'll also be able to do multi-room with this and so stereo pairing. And none stuff. of that All is that out. stuff that you can do with Sonos today, but you can't do it. With what if we box. live in a um, world where you could use multiple of these together? You know, it's funny. So you can't. You, can you will that. be able to do that, and, with these. and you can do that with these too. Oh god, um, which is kind of Taylor. Funny. Uh, Back off. <laughs> <laughs> which is funny. You can and you can set up multi-room with that. It's a little, little hinky. It's better to, if you want multi-room right now. Sonos is probably the best system for doing that. Uh, the people future, in the chat are asking us about the display on top. So I think Apple has been 
You want to get they've been up close? Need, they've been, not, I wouldn't say needlessly vague, but vague about what's happening with the speaker. So you see that it lights up like that? Mm-hmm. That's not a screen. That's a bunch of multicolored LEDs under like a cloudy glass layer. It's like a key bulb. Um, and it's just there to show you it's active. They can't actually display anything precise on that screen. They told me it's not designed to display text. So you can't add interface elements to that or anything. And then when you do play music, white LEDs light up on the sides here. So that's cool. But that's all that's really happening there. It's just a bunch of lights. It's also on top. So if you're across the room, yeah. you can't see it easily and stuff like that, uh, which is a little frustrating. All the other ones, except for the Sonos one, is very difficult to see its little light. But uh, the Google ones, the Echo devices, you can see across the room whether they've heard you or yeah. confirmed or doing anything. So the, the question people ask me, are you going to buy one? I buy everything. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, it's weird that I don't want to buy this. Like, I, I can't figure out where it fits into my yeah, well, that, that's, that surprising. And I actually, use Apple Music. Use Apple, Apple Music is my you primary You are the ideal service. customer for this because you use Apple Music. If you don't use Apple Music, that's an instant, like, non-starter. You have like, a good home stereo, right? Yeah. But, like, this thing sounds great. And I, I'm so enamored with what Apple did to make it sound good. I think it's just such cool technology. But all of the Siri stuff, all of the Apple Music restrictions, all of that to me is just, like, I don't, I can't figure out where it fits. And for me to not figure out where I can just like shove a gadget into my life is like very strange. Just get rid of one cantaloupe, <laughs> put it in your kitchen. But then you run into the problem with Siri, which can't do like two timers. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Last question. Somebody asked, is the fabric better on the Google Home or the HomePod? This is really, you have to go to an Apple store and like squeeze this. It's just it's not, strange. it's not at all what you'd expect. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think. This is like, like metal or plastic behind it's the It's plastic fabric. behind it. Yeah. So funny story from my review of the Home Max. Uh, I had it up on my mantle. It fell off my mantle because uh, it's actually very heavy. It's 12 pounds. Uh, and I damaged the front <laughs> cover uh, and it tears a little bit. Um, but this is, a, this is not the, the one that dropped. But uh, it is a plastic right. cover on that. It's very, okay. very Wait, we got it. We're, we're running way over here. Show. I'm going to answer this question. You cannot. Sorry. You cannot use this as a standalone. You have to have an iOS device. Yep. You can't just buy it and set it up out of the box. You, you can't have an... You, if you have Apple Music on Android, you're like one of those five people. Just sorry, like Apple doesn't care about you. You can't even set it up with a Mac, right? You, you can't, have to have an it's iOS. It's iOS. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot on speakers. Thank you so much for your questions. We're going to watch a quick video. This is uh, Nat Garen at CES just f failing to have a smart suitcase follow her. And then we're going to come back. Ash is going to be here. We're going to talk about some instant cameras. Take a look at this. We're still years away from planes with modular cabins, completely see-through walls, or trains with Hyperloop-like speeds. In the meantime, travel accessories companies are selling us on a vision of future travel in the form of smart luggage. These travel gear are supposed to make things feel modern and secure, but they may cause more headache than they're worth. Take the trend in autonomous luggage. These suitcases have computer vision technology built into them so they can recognize the owner and automatically roll after them as they're walking. Now conceptually, this is kind of neat. If you're a caretaker, having both hands free to tend to your family members is useful, especially at a place as chaotic as an airport or a train station. But in practice, the prototypes we saw have a long way to go. Take 90 Fun's Puppy One suitcase. It legitimately ran away from me. The tech is pretty impressive. It uses Segway's auto-balancing technology to propel itself, make smooth turns, and ride over bumps. But it turns out it's a lot more like a puppy off its leash when you throw it a curveball. A company called ForwardX makes a similar product called the CX-1. This suitcase did an okay job following me around, but sometimes missed turns and would bump right into me when I stopped moving. It's hard to imagine that these bags wouldn't plow into other people in the same way in a more crowded area. Basically, it was more work to babysit these so-called smart bags than it was to just lug my old dumb suitcase around. Not to mention that some of these smart bags could raise serious flags at TSA checkpoints. I know, because it happened to me back in 2016 with the first model of the blue smart bag that had exposed wiring and a non-removable battery. Given my experience, I reached out to a TSA to ask whether these new bags might cause disruption at security checkpoints, but all they told us was that they'll scan the bags as long as they're FAA compliant. And finally, there's price. <laughs> These things are not cheap. With crowdfunding projects for bags you can ride and autonomous suitcases going between $1,100 to $1,500. It's great that designers and engineers are thinking about making bags that make travelers' lives easier, especially for people with mobility impairments. But just like the hyperloops and flying cars of our time, it looks like we're still a few years away from that vision of the future.
We're back. All of these speakers have magically <laughs> disappeared. And Ashley has appeared. How's it going, Ash? I'm here. I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy that we don't have to talk to voice assistants anymore. You know, just get like, to talk to me. A real serious. human. Listen it's to so me. stressful. All right, you have brought us... Uh, a new instant camera. You yeah. were on the show last season mm -hmm. to talk about like the hot instant camera yeah. market that's developing. And that's the Instax, which is like the, I would say the standard bearer. Yeah, so this was the new, I came on the show last season to talk about this SQ10. This was Fujifilm's square photos. Uh, I can show you guys an example. This was the size, which is just square. It's not a mini Instax like they've previously made. And it was, it's a digital camera as well as an instant camera. So you can take photos, store them on a micro SD, edit them within the camera. This is a beautiful photo of the office. But yeah, do different things. Um, it's pretty simple and it was different for them at the time. And, people, and these are like hot sellers. Yeah. People love these I, things. I mean, I don't know if people love them, but they're cool. Yeah. They're cool. So then what is this? This thing looks great. Okay, so at CES this year. There's a fingerprint. Polaroid, yeah, it loves fingerprints. Polaroid was like, hey, we can do square too. And so they introduced the Polaroid Pop, and that's what this is. That is so This is a slow. massive touchscreen. <laughs> um, and it's sort of the same idea where it's a digital camera as well as you can print photos in these big square. Um, formats and then you also can have a micro SD so you can put these on your computer your phone whatever share them to Instagram um it is very bad <laughs> like very bad I want to show you guys though really quick I can do this so this is actually where you load the paper yeah I thought this was where it printed as well but and then it prints at the top okay. uh do you want me to show you how to take a photo yeah, on here nine. okay maybe I'll take a photo of Paul with his oh, yeah. camera so you have to Turn this around. It's so slow. Oh, what is that face, man? I don't know. That's my Polaroid <laughs> face. Uh. It just now loaded. Like, it's seriously the slowest thing. Okay, there you are, Paul. So, Look you at can, that guy. Wow. Like you can with the Fujifilm, you can edit it, but this has all of the terrible clip art stickers and things mm -hmm. like that. So, here we go. Bunch of clip art. Oh my God. We'll just put a big question mark yeah. by you. This is yeah. like the Submit downside it. of the smartphone supply chain is that people are able to do this stuff. And it's oh. the buggiest software. It's yeah. just so bad. I don't so know how bad. they found parts that are this bad. <laughs> <laughs> Anymore. <laughs> oh, like, and... Um, this is like a 10-year-old like a Android phone. I can write here, so I can just write your name. Wait, so that white border is just a lie? Yeah. In the sense of it doesn't contain ink. Mm. Right, so this or is... it doesn't contain the photo. Or the photo, right. It's just, it's just for looks. Like, here you have this whole... Wait. This is This is regular... It's like a real Polaroid. Yes, this is a real Polaroid. You have this here. This is just zinc paper, which is heat-activated ink. Yeah. And it's terrible. So I'm going to print this out. Zinc. I really hate <laughs> zinc. But zinc is cheap. It's less than a dollar a print, whereas yeah. real prints are expensive. So I'm going to print this out for you, Paul, because mm -hmm. I know you really, really want this. Oh, my God. So we're going to print. It's gearing up. The sound effects are awesome. I mean, to me, the whole point of this show is that we bring on things that look cool in pictures and renders and Kickstarters. Yeah, because yeah, I saw then, this at CS. I was like, it's cute. Yeah. It's pretty. And then we turn them on, and there are 10-year-old Android phones inside that make <laughs> horrible sounds and slowly, slow... It's still not out yet. It's still going. So, one nifty feature, which again, no one... You all, we all have smartphones, but okay. Anyway, you can record video on this, too, in 1080p. Why? Exactly. Can it's you like, print video? <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, my smartphone can record in like 4K. I know. So that's why, why it's done. Why, like, just some make. Bust ass Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> 60 frames per second. Ooh. <laughs> All right, here you go. <laughs> so, this is horrible. the reveal. It's a great it's, photo of me, I gotta say. It's pretty good. Are your, are your eyes closed? I'm also going to show you guys. Okay. There's a um, companion app. Of course, there is. It's just dumb because. You don't need digital copies. Like, Sean um, actually reviewed the SQ10. Oh, what is that sound? That's the, um... Oh, that's what she got. It's, it's... So, here's my... my The Instax and the other cameras like that are... They're part of this wave where they're, like... It's a little bit of a computer. Mm -hmm. But, like, really, it's about physical objects. It's, like, kind of retro-looking. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, like, capture this huge market, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then Polaroid got mad at them. Because they're like, wait, that's what we do. Yeah, so Fujifilm's been around for a very long time. Yeah. And in between season one and two right now, 
Fujifilm and Polaroid are now in a legal battle because Polaroid mm -hmm. says that Fujifilm is infringing on its patent. Polaroid, by the way, is bankrupt and sold all its intellectual property yeah. to just a whole. Oh, different. look, we have the document on the screen here. Yes, <laughs> and Neil is a lawyer. I so I brought Neli lawyer things. I love because lawyer Because I figured things. you love so lawyer things. So I just want to point out two things. This is the lawsuit that Fuji filmed. This isn't Polaroid suing Fuji. Right. This is Fuji just suing Polaroid for being annoying. Oh, yeah, wait. So the thing they said that they're infringing on is this white border. Polaroid right. says Fuji film That's copped right. the white border. And I would posit that Polaroid. Polaroid is infringing on its own white border. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, the point of this is Polaroid, if you look at this, it's not even Polaroid anymore. It's like a holding company for mm -hmm. trademarks. Right. And then this is Fujifilm saying it's declaratory judgment. So they're just going to the court and being like, can you make Polaroid go away? Which yeah. is incredible. Yeah, they say Polaroid just called them up and was like, you owe us millions of dollars, by the way. Yeah. Polaroid was at one time a great American success. Yeah, I love it. So <laughs> the thing is, Fuji has been a camera company. They know how to make cameras. Mm -hmm. They made a reasonably good camera that people really like. Polaroid is like, like a bunch of suits who like bought this trademark mm -hmm. and it seems like they just went to Shenzhen and bought like garbage parts part. yeah. like the worst parts if you look at this screen I probably can't see this on the camera the screen is like you're so used to your smartphone screen which is like super tightly laminated right this is like six inches under the cover it's just glass. so bad um and so they're just trying to cash in on this like craze with the Polaroid brand which is horrible Paul can I show you the off button because that's my yes. favorite thing because it's so dumb what? It there we go. Yeah, it's just a little touchscreen button. Um, also, just so you're aware, you can also, it also has oh, a good. very, very bad companion app. I was editing a beautiful photo Is here. this just the phone app blown up because you're on a tablet? Yeah, nice. exactly. Nice. Um, yeah, so they have All it for iOS or phone. Android. You can see your gallery. I made this picture of Chaim for him. These are photos that were taken on the camera, right? <laughs> yeah, on, <laughs> on the pop. But and you, now we're if you here. you took a photo on your iPad or iPhone, could you print it with it? You could. Okay. Yeah. Th I bet this camera's better than that one. Oh, it is. This is a 20 me megapixel camera, but so bad. <laughs> it's so bad. This is only a 3 megapixel camera, but it's somehow better. Right, because it's like optimized. Yeah. Shows. So the how much does the Fuji one cost? 280. 280. And the film is about uh, more than a dollar a print. Okay. And then the pop is 200. And the prints are less than a dollar a print. And they look like it. And they look like it. This is very bad. This is not a touch screen on the Fuji film, by the way. Yeah. So I used to see these at parties just like constantly. Yeah. And then they kind of trickled out. Do you think this fad continues on? Or this? Yeah, like... it's so fun. We yeah. actually bought a bunch of accessories, like different frames and like mm -hmm. clips to hang things up. I think people just love them. Like, why yeah. not? Yeah. Well, it's they love these white borders. Right, That's, the white borders. The consumers are out buying cameras. Like, <laughs> they don't want these white borders. And then you, what you do is you take your phone and you take a picture of this camera, of this uh, photo, on Instagram, the Instagram, and that. Right, yeah, because that's what they're trying to get at here. It's like, oh, you want to share these photos online. No one wants to share. But as we were talking about, it's like, no, you want to take a picture of the physical photo and then share the picture of the physical photo. Yeah. By that's the way, a cool thing to do. I know everyone's hot for an update on the, the central core. We don't know if it's landed on the drone ship yet. Ooh, is, it still still, is it blown up? We don't know. Okay. But there are live. There are now live shots of the car in space. Which is what? Choice. Okay. Good. Yeah. Wait, and they're can, taking him with the one. Can you like steer, steer the Hubble right now and look at a car <laughs> flying through space? No, he mounted cameras on the car. Oh, Elon. All right, we've just got a few minutes left. Let's answer some of your questions. A lot of people still have HomePod questions. That's like the main thing people want to know. What do you think of the HomePod? Yeah. What do I think of it? Yeah. I like how squishy it is. It is also, I was shocked when that was in a display on top. It's just not. This whole time, I was like, oh, it's a display. Are you a Spotify no. person? Yeah. Would so you, it would never. Would you ever switch from Spotify for sound quality? No. Mm. Not for me. That's the main thing. Are you, do you have a smart speaker? No. What I about, use uh, Bluetooth. What about this, though? What's <laughs> up? Yeah. Let's go to the archives. We forgot <laughs> to bring this thing out earlier. This is the iPod oh, Hi-Fi. Look how far we've come. So this... This thing was my original like party jam speaker. Because you, can you see this? Let me take this off. Hey, look, right it's here. got an aux in. It's got an aux in. It's got a regular power cord. And oh, then it's battery powered. My dude, oh, this hard. thing, this thing, what? Yeah, like six D cell batteries oh my back God. in the day. So we would go, we would go to parties in college, and we'd like stop at the CVS to buy D cell batteries. Wow. For iPod, iPod. This what is an app that about standards, man. Yeah, it's crazy. And then we'd plug our iPods into it. It was great. This thing sounded incredible. 
as well. Um, Steve Jobs, when he introduced us on stage, mm. he's like, I've owned speaker systems that cost more than you can imagine. <laughs> and this sounds better than all of them. And everyone's like, oh, I don't know about that. It didn't. It was like $700. It was ridiculously expensive. People are asking if you can set an alarm to wake you up with music on the uh, HomePod. And the answer, I believe, is no. It's the oh. same as Siri, whatever you can do with your phone. So, like, uh, you can't you do can that. You can set an phone. alarm. Right, not but it's not going to be. But you, you, you can pick a tone. People. <laughs> where are you that a one, uh, $6... Where one dollar six by four print is cheap. I don't think the print. The point is that they're cheap. They're no. Just in the market, that's like one of the cheapest. Right. Models. That's like as cheap as you're gonna get for a print. Right. It's not gonna be cheaper than that. Yeah. Well, it's want, a little less than a dollar. You want yeah. cheap prints? You gotta like walk in. Printing the card. is expensive because it's so wasteful. It's yeah. We just fun. need we just need information digitally. What if I like tangible things though? Well, is this tangible? <laughs> A whole world I want to hold the photo close to my heart every day. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, what else we got? Um, if everyone is asking me about privacy on the um, on the HomePod. So Apple's better at privacy than every other company mm -hmm. because they don't make their money in data. They make their money selling you things, um, which is another reason why not supporting Spotify is confusing because right. they're still selling you a HomePod. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're... It doesn't hurt them. Yeah, it's like not like you're stealing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um but yeah, so they don't collect any data. They try not to send anything to the cloud that they don't have to, whereas everything Amazon and Google do runs in the cloud. Yep. So that, that, I think, is if you are interested in that, most people, I think, just happily trade away their privacy at like a moment's notice without thinking about it. Um, but yeah, Apple is generally better at privacy things, and they're certainly not, they have no incentive to collect a bunch of your personal data. They don't want it. They're really good at making sure they don't take it when they don't need it. Um, should Apple make deals with Spotify and Hulu, et cetera, be more flexible? Well, they already have a deal with Hulu. Hulu is on the Apple TV. I think a good um, comparison for the HomePod is actually the Apple TV. So the Apple TV is Apple's thing. Mm -hmm. They run the iTunes store. They will happily rent you movies. They don't allow anyone else to rent you movies on the, iTunes, on the Apple TV. Mm -hmm. But YouTube's on there. Uh, Hulu's on there. YouTube TV is on there now. PlayStation TV is on there now. So, like, there's a bunch of other TV services on the Apple TV that do everything except the one thing Apple wants to do. So you could make the argument that they're they're more open on the Apple TV. I mean, yeah, it's true. They're more open on the Apple TV than like the watch or the HomePod. Oh. Do they just really need those subscribers for Apple Music? Is that what this is about? Apple, needs, Apple makes like a thousand billion dollars every quarter. Like, yeah. The 30 million Apple Music subscribers are not, or they're rounding I error. I feel like in Apple's head, you'd just be sad if you were using an inferior service like Spotify. And Apple doesn't want you to be mm. sad, they want you to be glad, so they will re restrict <laughs> They will force you into their yeah. great service. Um, and then another question, is the thing on top a display or not? This goes mm. to you. Yeah. You have a lot of expectations about that thing. Because you want it to be a display. I don't know, it just should be a display. Yeah. The fact that it's just lights is like, what? Yeah. I don't I know. Should be a display. It's very abstract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, like Alexa does a thing where it like points at you, which I think is I like the best that. feature. Yeah, of that, I, that's really like important. Very much, you know, you hate that. No, I like that. Oh, you do like that. Yeah, because it's responsive. Mm -hmm. Like when we didn't have time for it, but we put a stopwatch. Like one of the big differences in all of these is how quickly they respond. The HomePod is not the winner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's thinking hard. Siri is very slow. But you can speed up that feeling just by like lighting up. I think that light is so important. You mm. need to see that, I think, to know you're getting that interaction. Sure. Dude, this person just says, I love Spotify. Aw. I think that's Apple's big problem. Like, well, people, people really love Spotify. Yeah, I, love Spotify. I hate Spotify. I didn't, I, like I didn't know you were an Apple music person. Green. Huh? I don't like the green color. I just think Spotify's interface is just backwards. No. Like, it just doesn't let you know what music is available to you. It's like, would you like another playlist? Another robot has made another playlist. Yeah. <laughs> One of your cooler friends is listening to this music at this time. It's like, <laughs> I just want to see what's on my phone. You know? um, what do you want out of a second generation HomePod? I don't know. Ox? Yeah, you're never getting that. You think <laughs> Apple's putting a headphone jack? <laughs> well, it'd be nice if you had a headphone jack. <laughs> it'd be nice if it could be your home theater audio. Yeah. So many people have terrible TV audio, or they like buy a projector because projectors are great right now. Mm -hmm. But then running audio, like yeah, yeah. like you you put your Apple TV next to your projector, and then you have to run audio cables all the way to the front of your room mm -hmm. or something. It's messed up. I, I think so. This is like a cautionary tale. 
Like Apple put out a speaker ages ago. They're like, this is, we want a piece of that Bose action. Right. Um, great. And then they were not committed to it. They dropped it. Yeah. That market ran away from them. If you want to do HomePod and you're like interested in the home, you've got to like work in every room. So if you look at Amazon's lineup, they make a little one, they make a big yeah. one. On they make the screen. They make one with the battery. Camera. Yeah, they're like all over the place. It's like, what do you want? Everything was <laughs> here. You could just swallow. Yeah, Sonos makes, uh, you know, all kinds of speakers. They make amps. They make right. just little boxes that connect to your existing stereo. Like, they fit into all the rooms in your house. And, like, not everybody needs that. Some people just need one speaker. But people want to watch on their TV. People want to watch music in more than one room at a time sometimes. And, like, Apple has not figured out. They've not communicated, at least how they're going to do all of that. So They have come up with a way where I can read Neelai's text. <laughs> I Just think you saying anytime. it's the lonely person makes is yeah. accurate because it's like, I use a speaker for when friends come over. My friends yeah. want to be like, I want to play this new song, Bluetooth, or whatever it is, or just an aux cable. And now mm -hmm. it's like, okay, you don't use Apple Music. Hopefully you have an iPhone. Yeah. All right. Or, or like, it's just this, I or don't like know. the best the best version of this song is this like kind of live version that's on the YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, no. I play music off YouTube all the time. Yeah. I will say, Ashley brought up this point. I there's a line in the, this we gotta end the show, but there was a line in, in the review that was like, this is a product that seems like it was designed for a very demanding person who lives alone entirely within Apple's ecosystem. Right. And I kind of meant it as a burn. Yeah. And then all these people on Twitter are like, yeah, with me. Yeah. Like, get out, get out, get out of your house. It turns Make out that's my, uh, my Tinder profile. <laughs> yeah, it's awful. All right, that was our show for this week. Our first one on YouTube. Super excited that we're on YouTube. Super excited that we're talking to you. It was really fun having this chat open and hearing from all of you while we do the show. We're back every week, Tuesday, 4 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Uh, Ash is going to be here. Jake's going to be here. Paul's going to be here. I'm going to be here. We never run out of gadgets. We literally <laughs> never run out of gadgets. Uh, tweet at us. Let us know what you want to see on the show. We will always bring it here. We will always plug it in. We will al always show you exactly how it works, which is the most important thing we can do. It's always the most fun. So we'll see you here next week, 4 p.m. Tuesday.